Welcome back to the Sustainability Imperative, and thanks for joining us for track three. There's been three so far of investing in sustainability. In this next session, we're going to be joined by nonprofit leaders and experts in a renewable energies sector for a deep dive into the costs and rewards of doing business in an environmentally responsible manner. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the American Investment Council, for their support of this session. You can tweet us at at the Hill events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Sustainability. Do it a lot. We're broadcasting live. We'll be taking your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with your live stream, they say to refresh everything and it will work wonderfully. So with that, joining me now is Mindy Lover. Mindy is the president and CEO of the Sustainability Nonprofit Organization Series, where she works to mobilize investors and companies to factor sustainability into their decision-making process. Mindy, it's great to be with you. I wish I had met you about a year ago because I've been hanging out with more and more finance people, you know, Goldman Sachs types, BlackRock types. It's not a humble, you know, the Commodities Future Trading Corporation. And there seems to be this movement that I don't feel was there before, where there's more awareness by financial markets of climate risk um, and of the importance of getting, you know, dollars going into renewables in a way they weren't before. I sort of felt like it was a boutique before. I know this is what you advocate, what you work on, and you must be succeeding because it's finally hit me. So tell us about series and, and, and am I in the right sandbox? Uh, you're definitely in the right sandbox. And there is a mini revolution going on out there. Funny term to use as it relates to capital market leaders. I mean, series is a think tank NGO advocate that works to integrate sustainability into capital markets. We work with 130 publicly traded companies. Uh, about 520 global investors. We work to change what they do from the boardroom to the supply chain with companies to set sustainability goals, particularly around climate change, and to execute on them, to implement them, not just to talk about them. And we work with uh, 540 investors, to be specific, globally, who have come together with us um, particularly on climate change, to advocate for all companies in their portfolios to act on the financial risks of climate. And then we work to change policy and regulatory statutes. statutes. I mean, 15 years ago, we couldn't get the leadership of the world, world's largest publicly traded companies in a room or the large investors. We held forums and they'd send their environmental intern. Ten years ago, we had their attention. Five years ago, there were a lot of discussions. I'd say in the last two years, there is action, and that action is growing every single day. Yesterday, for some of you may have read in the New York Times, uh, we brought 300-plus CEOs into a discussion and a public discussion where they called on the administration to double what the Obama administration even called on, but called on the Biden administration to support them in the discussion and international talks that will happen next week to do everything they could to make the U.S. a leader on climate change and to move expeditiously. So 300 CEOs of the largest companies, of the Walmarts, of the Amazons, Coke, Pepsi, and on, those are the players who are saying this is not just a tree hugger environmental issue. Mm. Addressing climate is a material financial risk that demands action from all of us. It's, a, it's, it's heartening to hear that. And, and, you know, we had earlier today Rod Shaw of the Rockefeller Foundation on, but I remember about five years ago, six years ago, I moderated a forum with Judith Roden, his predecessor um, of the Rockefeller Foundation, about the financial markets and sustainability and resilience. And we had folks, I don't want to name names, but we had folks from the biggest banks in the country. And I decided to ask them, I said, are you and your job real or are you a fig leaf? Um, and I have to say that some of the people there were, were so honest and said, I have to admit, I'm a fig leaf. And we're not there at the point where the system has embraced us. We're like a cho in the door. What do you think has changed so that with you've got the buy-in from these CEOs and you say, what, what, is the, what is the factor that moved this from being a boutique to something of scale? And let me say it first, it's no longer a toe in the door but it's not the entire body and head yet either. Hmm. There's, we're somewhere at the waist level or a little bit. So there's far more buy-in. And the people from the banks, and I 
sit on advisory boards to the chairman of Morgan Stanley and a few of the others. We work closely with them. We have six of the largest banks in the United States of America making commitments to act on climate, five of whom may even set very firm net zero targets by 2040. Um, and they're on their way to doing that. Now they've got to show short, medium and long term goals and how they're going to get there. So the discussion's different. The leadership of those institutions is inv are involved. It's not just a policy person or a government affairs person. And the actions are different. We are in a wholly different place. So what is, how did they get there? Whether you're in Amazon or Walmart or JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, B of A. I mean, first of all, the facts have gotten more real. So it's not only the growing imperative that we all know that acting on climate literally will be the difference between our kids having a legitimate future or a horrible future. If there's anything COVID taught us is the interrelationships, how the economy and humanity are tied to these systemic risks. Climate will bring greater systemic risks. And I think that's become more clear as have the billion dollar losses to insurance companies and to investors. 20 different events over the last couple of years that cost over a billion dollars whether it's droughts or forest fires or any of the multiple implications. So I think the facts are different. I think the world has come around. And I think there's an interesting change overall in corporate America. And none of these things are black and white. But look at the fact that last weekend, 100 CEOs of the largest companies stood up and said, what's happening on voting rights? So we're off of climate change mm -hmm. and I'll come right back and took a position on the most pressing moral issue of democracy and values and said, this is not right and we may very well take our business out of your state. Um, that's remarkable. That wouldn't have happened three years ago, weighing in saying we've got an obligation as leaders of corporate America to speak out on things that truly matter to the fundamentals. So we're seeing more of that overall. On climate, it has been, I'd say over the last five years, we've gone from, you know, 15 years ago, it was working from small ice cream companies like Ben and Jerry's or seventh generation. And today it's the world's largest fortune 500 companies. Uh, and I'd say over the last five years, we've been making huge progress. In the financial world, it's been over the last two years that we're seeing the kind of bold, audacious commitments to being net zero companies that not only in the energy use at a bank, that's highly inconsequential, but to where they're putting their financing. And that's the key to the discussions. Now, again, I will tell you, we are not all there. We've got a long way to go, um, but we are well on our way. The other point that you mentioned was the Commodities Future Trading Commission, the SEC and others. Things change when you have regulatory pressure as well. And there should be. Hmm. You can't just have one bank at a time, one investment firm at a time. You need a level playing field, a policy that everybody has to live by. And we now have an administration, and we've talked to them 30, 40 times since they've been in, who are interested in how do you regulate climate as a financial risk, not just what should the EPA do, but what should the Federal Reserve do, and what should the SEC do, and what should Janet Yellen do as the Treasury Secretary? How many Treasury secretaries' nomination processes talked about climate risk? Probably never before until Janet Yellen. She sees this as a priority. So wow. it's not only new facts, it's pressure from regulators. Mindy, just, just real quick, we're, uh, sadly, I, I love this conversation and I could talk you know, uh, with you endlessly about what's happening in the financial sector and how to get scale. But let me just ask you, when you're talking to these large firms that are out there doing this now, you know, I've always had a view that there are good people and good institutions that want to do good, but as long as it's philanthropy, it won't reach scale. But if their bottom line is feeling, which I'm sensing is that's what's driving this, are there missing pieces in terms of government awareness or literacy or that dimension that should be part of the environment with what's going on? Or do you think gravity is moving the companies the, where they need to go on their own? No, I think it's a combination of gravity and regulatory changes. I mean, the Securities and Exchange Commission a mere month ago said, we're gonna reconsider rulemaking on climate risk disclosure. That means requiring companies 
to disclose the material financial risk. You can't tell me that climate risk is not as material or important as other risks like trade risk and inflation risk and currency risk, all of, get, all of which get disclosed. And I think we'll see that this administration has said they are prepared to move that. And I believe it will. Apple this week, in this instance, came out first major Fortune 50 company saying we want climate risk disclosure. Everybody presumes companies will never support more disclosure. Corporate lawyers say, you know, fewer words are better. Don't disclose when you don't have to. Apple said, you got to put this information on the table. We've been advocating for it for 10 years. The SEC passed guidance, which is not quite a regulation 10 years ago, but it hasn't been implemented and enforced. And I think in the next year, we will see things like that. I sat on a task force of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, one of the only advocates, NGOs, uh, with about 30 major corporate leaders, uh, hmm. bank leaders, even oil companies. And together we came out with a consensus document that said you need mandatory climate risk disclosure. So there'll be some who fight it and they'll fight it at the SEC and they'll fight it at the Federal Regulatory, at the Federal Reserve. But I think the momentum is there for change. And I think regulators, if you listen to what the Biden administration is saying, they are ready to move and move aggressively to, to understand and to act on climate risk as a financial matter. And that will change the way companies work. Well, Mindy Lubber, president and CEO of Ceres, is fascinating to talk about this. I've seen it, the reports of the CFTC and various things about how we're going to price in environmental risk into, which, which is the way you get scale over time, you know, potentially with the behavior of, of, of large markets and large companies. So really, really appreciate your views. You're welcome back anytime. I could, you know, I really want to keep going, but I've got, uh, I've got the secretary of the Environmental Protection Agency in California that we want to, you know, continue this with him too. So thank you so much, Mindy. Sounds great. We'll look forward to talking again. Be well.